thank some of our uh, junior faculty for being very uh, accommodating and adaptive to changing programs when we quickly need to do it because other exigencies come up. So Allison just volunteered last week to uh, fill in the, the slot. Allison was an um, undergraduate uh, in psychology at UCLA and then was at the PG SP Stanford PhD um, um, psychology program uh, and did her uh, PhD thesis on um, family uh, work uh, in bipolar disorder. Uh, she is currently assistant uh, professor here at uh, UCLA and, er, at UCSF and, uh, and is in our anxiety and OCD clinic program. So thank you Allison. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, so today we're going to talk about all about distress tolerance and one thing to note is that some of you when you think of distress tolerance you think it ties closely with DBT and DBT skills of how to manage distress tolerance. But I want to separate those two things. So we're going to be talking about the concept of distress tolerance rather than skills to use to manage distress tolerance. Okay, so objectives for today are to explain to you how I came to love exposure therapy and truly believe in how effective it is. I will explain the link between exposure therapy and distress tolerance. In the middle, we're gonna be talking about inhibitory learning and how exposure therapy and distress tolerance link up. My goal is to convince you to incorporate distress tolerance into your practice, no matter who you are and what you do and who you work with, and to convince you to convince parents to allow their kids to be comfortable. So, the topic of today is discomfort. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a video here and I'm not gonna give you any context about it. I just want you to watch it for a little bit and just kind of take note of your experience. Um, so, noting your experience here, just kind of curious about how you were feeling. Um, I'm actually on that boat. So I was on the starboard side here, um, and this was 2005, and it was semester at sea, which for those of you that don't know, it's a study abroad program where you're living on a cruise ship with 500 other college students, and you're traveling around the world and studying all about the different places that you're going to. I was a psychology major, so I was also learning all about cross-cultural psychology. Sounds like a really cool thing. Well, turns out that 10 days into our trip, we get stuck in the middle of the North Pacific in January, um, and there were two hurricanes in the area. And one of the waves caused by the hurricanes was so large that it crashed over the ship, broke the window of the bridge, and short-circuited our electrical system, so we had no engine power. So here we are, sitting ducks, um, absolutely terrified, very close to capsizing and all dying. So it was just 500 college students about to die in the middle of the North Pacific. Um, the video that you can see is filmed by the Coast Guard. They're the ones flying in the helicopter. Um, there's no way they could have rescued us because as you can see, it's so rocky that there's, it's absolutely impossible for anybody to get off that ship. Luckily, somebody was able to bring power back to one of the engines and we slowly made our way out of the storm. Um, but it was absolutely terrifying um, and we would talk to the ship's engineer after the fact and he said like we really should have died like we really should have capsized and died so it was kind of a miracle that we didn't <laughs> happy to still be here <laughs> so what happened uh, oh here I have some pictures uh, that I took I'm sorry about the picture quality it was 2005 um, it was 2005 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually I, I uh, don't remember where my digital copies are so I took pictures of these pictures 
Um, but here we are in our life jackets. Um, we had to get our life jackets on and sit on the floor where the lifeboats are, although of course we couldn't actually go out to the lifeboats. Um, and we were just sliding back and forth. So you could see in the video that the ship was tilting one way or the other. Um, and I was actually near the kitchen. And so as we were sliding, I could also hear the, like, the plates crashing and sliding. So that's my, my sensory memory of this traumatic experience. So we made our way to the closest island. Oh, and here's um, pictures of at the aftermath. And everything was broken, and this is the library. So you can see it was just completely a mess. And then my uh, hometown newspaper did an article about me. <laughs> <laughs> right here. It's quite famous for a day. Uh, it's very exciting. Cupertino Courier. <laughs> um, so we made our way, after they fixed the engine, we made our way to the nearest island, which turned out to be Hawaii. So not a very bad place to be shipwrecked. But we couldn't really enjoy it because we didn't know what was going to happen. Our ship was completely broken. Everyone's traumatized. Uh, we're trying to figure out what to do next and what's going to happen next. What they decided to do was, as they were in the process of fixing the ship, they were going to fly us to all the different places we were supposed to go. So we were leaving Vancouver on that ship, and we were supposed to go to South Korea. We completely missed that. We were supposed to go to Japan. We completely missed that. But they said, let's pick up with the curriculum and fly you to China and then Vietnam. We'll fix the ship, and the ship will meet you in Vietnam, and you'll keep going on your way. During this process, a lot of the students were thinking like, do I still want to do this? How am I going to get back on that ship? We were all terrified and almost died. So it turns out that 10 students decided to drop out of the program. And myself and many of the other students decided to keep going. And I did think like, gosh, do I really want to keep doing this? I can't imagine living on that ship for the next few months. I can't imagine being away from my family at this time. But I decided to keep going, and I'm very glad that I did. One, because I had the most amazing experiences and went all over the world and saw incredible things. But two, because getting back on that ship once with met us in Vietnam was one of the most important things I could have done. I was living on the ship at the site of where I had this traumatic experience for months. It was the ultimate exposure therapy. And I was wondering, as a psychology major, I knew about PTSD, and I was thinking at the time on the ship of like, Am I going to have PTSD? What's going to happen? What's going to be the long-term effects of this? Will I be terrified of boats and the ocean? Will I ever be able to get on a boat again? Turns out, I don't have PTSD. I've been able to go on many boats since then. I still love being on the ocean. Watching that video does make my heart race a little bit. Um, but overall, no lingering effects. And I firmly believe it's because I had the ultimate in-exposure experience while living on that boat. So I really wonder about those 10 kids that wound up leaving the program. Do they have PTSD now? Are they able to get on boats? I don't know. But this was kind of like the most impressive exposure experience I could ever imagine. That would be a good research project. <laughs> <laughs> to contact those 10 kids and be like, what happened? Yeah. Are you still traumatized? <laughs> it would be good. Um, OK, so this leads me to the power of exposure therapy. I know it personally. You all know it professionally. Maybe personally, too. I don't know. Um, but it really is the gold standard of treatment for many disorders that we treat. So gold standard of treatment for OCD, every anxiety disorder, and of course, trauma. So it's my job to convince you that we can actually use exposure in many different things, aside from these disorders, too. And we do it with distress tolerance. Let's talk a little bit about avoidance, because exposure is the opposite of avoidance. We know that people avoid things that make them uncomfortable and afraid, because we don't like to be uncomfortable and afraid. So avoidance is a coping strategy. It's just a really ineffective coping strategy that only serves to fuel the anxiety cycle or the OCD cycle or the trauma cycle or whatever it is that you're working on. So, Avoidance is very duplicitous because it feels nice in the moment, it gives us some relief, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it keeps the cycle of psychopathology going. So researchers have shown that avoidance of anxiety may actually lead to anxiety disorders. The people that are more likely to approach the things that make us anxious are less likely to get disorders. Also, a lot of times people talk about avoidance as a compulsion. So if we're thinking about OCD, you may have heard of a type of OCD called pure O, which is purely obsessions, no compulsions. So these people have intrusive, upsetting, uncomfortable thoughts, but they don't do any ritualistic behavior. I heard in my, the course of my career, I've heard a lot about like pure O, how do you treat pure O? And I say, there's no such thing as pure O because avoidance is a compulsion. If we think about the definition of a compulsion, it's whatever we do to try to reduce or eliminate the discomfort. 
when we avoid something in order to avoid having those intrusive thoughts or avoid the discomfort of those intrusive thoughts, trying to push the thoughts away, well, that's a compulsion, right? So there's really no such thing as pure O. Oh, it's just avoidance is a compulsion. In addition, avoidance does not allow for expectancy violation. So I'll give you a social anxiety example. Let's say someone with social anxiety has this fear that they're gonna get up, give a presentation in front of the class, make a mistake, and everybody in the audience will laugh at them. That's their belief. Well, they actually give that presentation. They may realize that, well, maybe they make a mistake sometimes, but people probably aren't gonna laugh, right? Most likely case, most of the people aren't gonna laugh. So, if I avoided giving this presentation, if that were my fear, then I wouldn't have the opportunity to experience, well, maybe I won't make a mistake, but even if I do, people probably aren't gonna laugh and it's gonna be okay. So we need to face our fears in order to realize that the worry thoughts are likely untrue, or even if they do happen to be true, we can handle it. It also, avoidance also does not allow for the experience of mastery, right? So being able to face something that is difficult, master it, and feel good about that, right? It's such a rewarding experience to do an exposure successfully, and avoidance doesn't allow for that. And then finally, and in my opinion, most importantly, avoidance sends the message that anxiety is intolerable. We cannot handle feeling anxious. We cannot handle feeling uncomfortable. Gotta make it go away. Okay, so let's briefly talk about the anxiety cycle, which is probably familiar to many of you. So it always starts with some sort of trigger. Um, so let's say, in this instance, the worry is about grades. And we've got a teenage girl who's worried about grades, and the trigger is a math test. Now that math test isn't really good or bad, it just is. But it's how she thinks about it and what she does about it that can make it bad. So let's say that her worry thought is she's gonna fail. And no matter how much she studies, it's not gonna help, she's still gonna fail. Then she might get physical symptoms, like her heart might start beating faster, maybe she's breathing a little faster, she feels nauseous. And then comes the experience of anxiety. Anxiety is a very uncomfortable emotion. We have a lot of uncomfortable emotions, but anxiety is so physical that it's super uncomfortable. We don't like feeling anxious. We wanna make it go away. There's two main strategies for trying to make anxiety go away that are ineffective, which we know. One main one is avoidance or escape, right? So in this math test example, if she says, you know what, I'm gonna just push it away. I'll study tomorrow. Future girl can worry about that. Procrastination, right? In the moment, it feels better because then she doesn't have to directly face the math and her worry about it. So feeling better is showing her, oh, this worked. My avoidance worked. This was an effective strategy for getting rid of my anxiety. We all know it's not a very good long-term solution because the math test doesn't go away. She's just pushed it off down the road a little bit, creating a negative reinforcement loop. So the anxiety went away. That's the negative part going away. Um, and then, of course, it's reinforcing this avoidance behavior, making it more likely for the avoidance to continue to happen in the future, usually just making the anxiety get worse. Another strategy that people will try to use to get rid of anxiety is reassurance, kind of going in the opposite direction. Or maybe this girl will try to overstudy, try to memorize everything, ask all kinds of questions to the teacher. In reality, it's just more avoidance of the anxiety. Right? So the most important thing in fueling the anxiety cycle is that avoidance piece of the intolerance of the anxiety. We have to get rid of that and sit with our anxiety and learn that we can be anxious and that it's okay. So let's take a little trip back to intro psych and talk briefly about behaviorism and classical conditioning. Um, so if you remember the, uh, the little Albert experiment with uh, Watson and Rayner, what they learned was that when they took an unconditioned stimulus, it created an unconditioned response. So a loud noise made little Albert scared and he cried. Then they had a neutral stimulus, which was the white rat. And that didn't create any response. So at first, little Albert's like, oh, cool rat. No big deal. When they paired the loud noise with the white rat, that resulted in the fear and the crying, the unconditioned response. So they continued to pair these things, the noise and the rat, which resulted in conditioned stimulus, the white rat, leading to a conditioned response, the fear and the crying. So all of a sudden, Albert developed this strong fear of this rat. Okay. Now, let's take a moment to think about the theoretical orientation behind exposure therapy and why exposure therapy works and what it does to all that learning that we just talked about with the conditioned stimulus. In the past, exposure therapy was all based on habituation, right? And so if I continue to give Albert this rat without the noise, 
Eventually, that bond between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus will be broken, and he will habituate to the rat, and he will no longer be scared of the rat. So that's nice. In the habituation model, it says the subjective units of distress is the measure of <coughs> corrective learning. So if Albert was, say, 10 and could tell us how scared he was, maybe he would start out with the rat being like an eight out of 10. And then after repeated exposure to the rat, maybe they're saying that he habituates to it and then all of a sudden his fear is more like a three. So they're using that, the said, the subjective units of stress as a measure that the exposure is working and that he's learning that the loud noise and the rat are no longer connected. Okay, so that's nice. And habituation obviously is a real thing, but the problem is that clinicians and researchers found that there were problems with this model. Primarily, that exposure with habituation model orientation was not leading to very good generalization across contexts and across time. It was causing more relapse. So they wanted to take a look at what's gonna be a more meaningful, long-lasting form of exposure therapy. And researchers have found that tolerance of fear is much more important than the reduction of fear itself. So we don't actually need fear to go down in that moment. We just need to learn, have people learn that they can be afraid and they can handle it. Um, so Krask and several other researchers started looking at inhibitory learning. So in this concept, they're saying that the original pairing between the US and the CS is not gone. So that pairing, that learning, that the connection between the noise and the rat, it's not gone. It's just that there's this new secondary learning where it's like the rat without the noise, and that becomes stronger over time and more salient over time. So it's almost like if you take the same route to work every day, and you're just used to taking this route, and then one day, for whatever reason, you don't take that route anymore, maybe there's construction, and you take a different route, and you're like, oh, I kind of like this route better. Maybe it's a little bit prettier. Maybe you actually get to work one minute faster. That old route is still there. It doesn't go away. But there's just a new route that may become kind of more important in your mind, more easily accessible. Okay, so let's go back to that behaviorism. So in the habituation model, the conditioned stimulus is continuously not paired with the US, breaking apart those bonds. In the inhibitory learning model, they're saying that those bonds still exist, we just have this new, more salient, stronger bond that those things aren't paired. Now, what does this actually do to what we do as clinicians? It shifts practice in a way that's meaningful and really, really good. One of the reasons it's really good is because some patients don't habituate in session. I'll give you an example. I worked with a 13-year-old who had OCD, um, and he had contamination OCD, mostly involving his family. Um, he would never habituate. Like, no matter what exposure I gave him, his suds would stay the same. If I were working from an older model, the habituation model, I would say, okay, well, this kid isn't gonna benefit from therapy, so this isn't helpful. Let's, let's not do this. Maybe just try medication or try something else, or I don't, maybe we'll try it later, come back to it. Um, but that's not the case, right? Because we don't actually need habituation to have learning. So over time, <coughs> over a long period of time, he did habituate and he really learned. He learned that he could handle the things that make him uncomfortable. He could touch his family. Um, and then we got to a place where his OCD symptoms were subclinical and we terminated and it was wonderful, right? It was such a good experience for him. He worked really hard, faced tough stuff, and kind of did a great job. So if I was using the habituation model, I would not have continued to work with this kid. And there are plenty of other patients that are the same way. They don't habituate in session. Habituation is not prognostic, which means that just because someone doesn't habituate has no bearing on whether or not they will do well in therapy, it has no bearing on whether or not they're gonna make progress. So we need to rethink it. <clears throat> this also led to rethinking how we treat OCD in a classical CBT way, where we stop doing so much cognitive restructuring and relaxation because that actually decreases the anxiety. So with OCD, the goal was, how can we do these exposures and stay uncomfortable rather than let's try to use kind of corrective thinking and relaxation to make that discomfort drop. And that's not the case with other disorders. Of course, we still use cognitive restructuring for other things and it is helpful. But it did significantly change the way that we treat OCD. So we're not expecting or hoping that the anxiety is gonna go down. Instead, we're shifting focus to thinking that we're just gonna tolerate the anxiety better. 
So it's like lifting weights over time. So if you can imagine starting to work out with a 20 pound dumbbell, at first that dumbbell is going to be really heavy and it's going to be hard. But if you continue to practice it and you build muscle, that dumbbell doesn't get any lighter. It's still 20 pounds. You're just stronger. So distress tolerance is just like lifting weights in that things don't necessarily get easier. We just get better at handling them until we learn like we can handle discomfort. We can handle anxiety. It's okay. So specifically, how do these things shift practice? Well, we wanna be taking a look at expectancy violations. So we wanna be looking at what does the fear tell us and then violate that thing. I'll give you an example. I worked with a kid with uh, contamination fear where if he ate a piece of food off the ground, he thought that he would get sick within five minutes. This is the perfect expectancy because <laughs> you can really test it out in session. I said, okay, eat the food. Let's wait six minutes and see what happens. Um, so, if you can't do that, if there's no neatly, uh, neat time that fits within a session, you can also ask, how long do you expect to be able to tolerate this fear? How long until you think the fear is going to get to a point where it's so uncomfortable you have to stop, or to the point where it might go down, I don't know. So let's ask the patients what's their expectation of how they can tolerate it, and then try to violate that. If you can't do that, because sometimes kids are like, I don't know, it could be at any point in the future. Then you work collaborative, collaboratively with the patient to come up with a predetermined time frame as your goal. So this is a big shift because in the past, <coughs> when we used habituation model, we were waiting until suds went down by about 50%. So if somebody started an exposure at six, we'd be waiting until it went down to three. Okay, so this is very different in that we don't actually care about whether or not suds go down. That's nice for the patient, right? but it doesn't actually mean that they're learning anything different. Instead, we wanna violate their expectation and that's going to decide how long we do an exposure for. One other shift that's very important, obviously, is distress tolerance. So it's a shift from, you're gonna feel better soon. If you just keep going, you're gonna habituate, you'll feel better. Two, you can handle this. I don't know if you're gonna feel better. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but you will get better at doing this and you can handle it. Also, another shift is variable practice. So in the past, we would make a nice and tidy hierarchy, right, a ladder hierarchy for exposure, and we would start at the bottom and do that until we habituate, go up a step and do that till we habituate, and so on. Well, research shows that that's actually not the best way to do it, <coughs> and that we can totally flip the order. And it's gonna have better generalizability if the order is unexpected. So one way you could even do it is you create your ladder, because it's always useful to know. And I tell my patients, I'm not gonna ask them to do eight, nines, or tens on sets. So I still use sets, because I still think it's a valuable measurement. Um, I'm just not looking for them to come down necessarily. So I tell my patients, I'm not gonna have you do eight, nines, tens, but anything seven or below is fair game. And let's kind of mix it up. You can even roll a dice and say, okay, we're, you know, let's do one of these. So you don't need to go <coughs> neatly up the ladder with habituation, instead you can mix it up, which is gonna have better generalization. In addition, you wanna mix up the context. So for instance, in the white rat experiment, rather than just pairing that one rat, you might look at a brown rat or a gray rat or a mouse. Maybe your rat in a different place. So you're gonna wanna mix up the context as well. And focus on the two most important generalizing principles of exposure, which is distress and uncertainty. So I don't care what it is, but if the exposure is causing distress and uncertainty, that is a good exposure. And of course, uncertainty leads to distress. And then finally, one big shift too, is pairing multiple CSs together. So for instance, let's say a kid has, this is actually a true story, this happened. A kid has an OCD obsession about giving someone the middle finger, thinking that's gonna uh, make him you know, punished by God, and then also has a fear of littering because that's similarly bad thing to do. So first I had him give me the middle finger repeatedly, then I had him litter repeatedly, and I put those things together, right? So why don't you go down the street littering and giving me the middle finger at the same time? <laughs> okay, so what is distress tolerance? Well, um, Simon and Gayher define it as the capacity to experience and withstand negative psychological states, and it consists of evaluations and expectations of negative, negative emotional states with respect to tolerability and aversiveness. So how can I handle this and how bad is this discomfort? Appraisal and acceptability. So is it okay to be uncomfortable? Because some people think it's really not okay. Uh, the tendency to absorb attention and disrupt functioning. So can I be uncomfortable and actually do stuff or is it just completely taking over my mind? 
and regulation of emotions and the strength of the tendency to avoid or immediately attenuate the experience. So if I'm distressed, do I have to get out of this right away or can I handle it? And then later my colleagues talked about just good distress tolerance is the tolerance of ambiguity, uncertainty, discomfort, negative emotional states, frustration. So if someone with poor distress tolerance would say, distress is terrible, I can't handle it, I have to escape it, I can't do anything while I'm distressed, and I am worse at handling distress than other people. Whereas good distress tolerance is well-developed distress tolerance skills that include the ability to persist in goal-directed activity while experiencing emotional distress. So this is really important, right? The ability to do what we need and want to do despite feeling uncomfortable. That applies to every single kid or teen that you see in your office, right? Or adults too. There's been some research on distress tolerance, although not as much as you might expect. So the research shows that poor distress tolerance is linked with increased risk of substance use, delinquent behavior, self-harm, and internalized symptoms. And this, the distress tolerance research is mostly in the areas of eating disorders, borderline personality disorder, and substance use. But there has been a good shift starting in the 21st century of incorporating distress tolerance into transdiagnostic treatment models. So ACT, the Unified Protocol by Barlow, and Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, they all incorporate the idea of distress tolerance as a main feature of getting better. So I'm gonna give some examples with specific disorders to show you how each disorder really can use distress tolerance. So first example is with trichotillomania. And this is really a very strong, uncomfortable urge to pull the hair, which leads to pulling the hair in order to avoid the discomfort, right? So it's the avoidance of that discomfort that causes the hair pulling. Most people don't want to pull their hair. Um, in ACT, they define this as an internal private event, right? So if we think about it, the, the urge is this internal private event. It's this feeling of discomfort that's causing us to pull the hair. Um, and then in Doug Woods and company's treatment model for this, they describe it as the importance of willingness, willingness to experience the urge without pulling the hair. So how open you are to experiencing your own experience when you experience it without trying to manipulate it, avoid it, escape it, change it, and so on. So when the urge is to pull is up here at 10 and you're trying really hard to control that urge and make it go down, you're not willing to experience the urge. So instead, right, if, if, if urge is up here at 10, you want your willingness to experience the urge up here too. We have to be willing to be uncomfortable in order to fight trichotillomania. So I think that that quote is one of my favorite ones of how open you are to experiencing your own experience when you experience it without trying to manipulate it, avoid it, and so on. I think that's so important because that's so true of every single psychiatric disorder, right? We have to be open to experiencing what we're experiencing. Otherwise, we're not effective. So the idea behind working on a trick is sit with the discomfort, act effectively. I can be uncomfortable, but it's what I do that's important. I can handle being uncomfortable. So another example is with panic, right? And so obviously we know that this is the fight, flight, freeze response that gets activated and a misinterpretation of body <coughs> symptoms where we experience our physical sensations as dangerous, <coughs> panic attack. So one really good way to treat panic is interoceptive exposure. So here we have a picture of a little girl doing one where she's breathing through a straw and holding her nose. Um, and Knowles and Olatunji uh, describe it as focus is on changing maladaptive beliefs regarding the inherent dangerousness of panic-related body sensations by exposing patients to these sensations. And it's really important to increase the tolerance of negative emotional experiences. That's key to reducing functional impairment. As distressed clients learn how to cope with their emotional and physiological response to stress and return to activities they had previously avoided. This kind of change is exemplified by statements such as, I felt anxious, but I did it anyway. I want every single patient that comes into my office, no matter what reason they're coming in, to experience that, I felt anxious, but I did it anyway. Uh, and with trauma, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is actually of a little girl during one of the recent fires. And you can see she's like hiding the eyes of her doll because it was scary. I just love it. Um, so as we know with trauma, exposure is a super important part of trauma. And in trauma-focused CBT, they don't actually look for reduced distress to the trauma. Instead, they're looking for reduced symptoms, right? That's so much more important. So they're not saying if you do a trauma narrative, you're gonna feel all of a sudden better about it and it's gonna be less scary. But what they're saying is if you do this trauma narrative, you're going to be better able to manage the thoughts and memories that you experience. 
So uh, a really good analogy that they use is it's just like cleaning a wound. When we have a wound, we have to clean it out in order for it to heal properly or it can get infected. When we have trauma, we have to go in there and we have to take a look at it in order to heal properly or it can get infected. So the key components of trauma-focused CBT are obviously exposure, external validation, so incorporating the parent and having the parent help validate that child's experience, and internal validation, right, using cognitive restructuring for the kid to validate their own experience and kind of rework some of those negative thoughts. And then the last one I'll talk about is depression. So a key component to treating depression is behavioral activation. This is inherently distress tolerance, right? You have no motivation to do things. You really don't think it'll be fun, and we want you to go do things anyway. So how can you make yourself go do something and be uncomfortable? And one thing that we do is expectancy violation. We use pleasure predicting logs where we say, how enjoyable do you think this is gonna be? Go do it and see how enjoyable it actually is, which is good because sometimes their expectation is not quite what reality is. But also it's not that important. Like even if they were miserable the whole time, that's okay too because they did the thing anyway and that's what's important. And we can also use expectancy violation with the time that they can tolerate the activity. So if they think that they can do the activity for 20 minutes and then all of a sudden they're gonna be like too, too fatigued, too depressed, can't handle it, like let's try it for 25. See if you can do it. See if you can push yourself and just notice what happens. And of course this is also very much in line with ACT. Um, which is all about like, can I accept my current state of depression while still doing what I need and want to do? Okay, so moral of the story, distress is not the enemy. It is totally normal. <coughs> and not only is it normal, but it's a good part of developmental milestones because it helps us build resiliency. It helps us manage uncomfortable experiences. It's important that we all experience a range of emotions over the course of our lives because that is what leads us to be able to deal with hard stuff. Anxiety is not good or bad. It just is, it's an emotion, right? What we do about it could be good or bad, but anxiety itself is just uncomfortable. It's not good or bad. Same thing with other emotions too, right? Like anger. Anger is an uncomfortable emotion for a lot of people. And if I ask kids, like, is anger good or bad? The young ones will usually say bad. I'll say, yeah, trick question. It's not good or bad, it just is, it's an emotion. And we all have it. What we do about it is what's important. And kids are willingly facing these distressing moments at all times, just it might be more physical distress rather than emotional distress. So for instance, a lot of kids are athletes and they put themselves through like really uncomfortable experiences thinking nothing about it. It's making them tough, right? So why can't you do it with emotional distress too? Let's shift a little bit to talk about parents' ability to tolerate distress. Because when we work with kids, we work with parents, and oftentimes this might be the hardest component of our work. So when we have anxious kids, we may also have anxious parents. Happens more time than not. And so not only do we wanna teach our kids to be okay with discomfort, we wanna teach our parents to be okay with their discomfort and the discomfort of their kids, which is hard. Because we always think that good parents comfort kids. If you think about like, what's, who's a good parent? They're responsive, right? They comfort their kids. But good parents comfort kids sometimes. And that's so important, right? Because kids need to be able to experience a range of emotions they need to be able to deal with uncomfortable things, with distressing things, with disappointments. That's how they build resiliency and develop good distress tolerance skills. <coughs> so it's very important for parents work on their own distress tolerance and recognize that it's okay for their child to be unhappy. It's okay for a child to be distressed. So one good example is sleep training, right? Which is like teaching your baby to put him or herself to sleep essentially. And in order to do that, you have to let the baby cry. Um, so if you take a look at parents that have more than one kid with the first kid, maybe it's really hard, like, oh, my baby is crying. I really want to go comfort it. It's really, really hard. And then with the second kid, it's like, oh, okay. She can cry. Um, and it's perfect exposure, right, between kid one and kid two. Another example is rescuing. So parents often have the urge, especially anxious parents, they have the urge to go in and rescue a child. So for example, I worked with a family where the teenager was extremely anxious about homework. And so the mother, and this is a 16 year old girl, the mother would sit with her the entire time during homework and be like kind of doing the homework for her because mom couldn't handle kid getting really worked up, right? This isn't helping because it's teaching the girl she can't do it on her own and it's not okay to be anxious. And so instead I was trying to coach the mom to kind of step back, like it's nice to help but there's also gonna be times when she's gotta do it on her own. So stepping in and rescuing is really just reassuring yourself and not the child. It's so important to have a range of emotions, as I said. And there's two uh, writers that I think do a really good job 
illustrating this. So one is a book <laughs> called The Blessing of a Skin Knee by Wendy Mogul, and another is um, Lori Gottlieb, who writes for The Atlantic, and she wrote an article called How to Land Your Kid in Therapy. Um, and this article is free if you Google The Atlantic and search this article. And it's really nice because it's also written for lay people, so parents can read it. And I just think it's a really good expression of why it's important for parents to allow their kids <laughs> to have a range of emotions and for parents to allow their kids to be unhappy sometimes. <laughs> so I have a video um, of these two ladies speaking, and I'm going to um, show you a few minutes of it just because I think it's a really nice illustration of this. Maybe not. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I'll just explain what they're talking about because I think the feedback is going to be too uncomfortable. Um, but you, this is on YouTube, so if you look up those two women, uh, you can find it. Um, and basically what they're talking about is um, parents will kind of rescue kids a lot and kind of need kids to always be happy. And this was more of a trend in the past few decades. Whereas in the past, parents kind of were maybe more punitive or, or punishing. And now, a lot of parents have this idea of like, child must be happy all the time, child must be safe all the time. And um, what Lori Gottlieb was saying, she's a psychologist, and she was saying that she noticed that a lot of kids were coming into her office and saying they're really depressed, but they don't know why. Um, and they're like, my parents are my best friends. They were such good parents. I don't know why I'm depressed. But it's like these 24-year-old people are kind of out in the world for the first time and they're hearing no, or they're not getting a job that they want, or their boss is saying something critical of them, and they've never really been taught to handle it because their parents were their best friends. The parents, as they were growing up, were always kind of swooping in to rescue them and telling them, you're great and everything's gonna be okay. Now, obviously, I have no problem with parents telling their kids that they're great, but it's also really important for parents to recognize that kids need to be disappointed. And so the whole, like, everyone gets a trophy thing is really unhelpful because you're not teaching kids that like, no, in real life, not everybody gets a trophy. You're not gonna get into every college you want. You're not gonna get into the job you want. You're not gonna be able to do every single thing you want to do. So instead, let's shift to working hard and critical thinking rather than kind of praising everything. Um, and Wendy Mobile has a nice quote in here where she talks about parents like uh, praising kids for breathing. Like, oh, you breathe in and you breathe out, it's so wonderful. And we wanna be kind of conscious of what we're praising and recognizing that kids can't be happy all the time. So I do uh, recommend, recommend this video. If you want a link to it, you can email me. Sorry about the sound. Oh, I switch. Okay. So, bottom line is we can handle distress. So here are two nice quotes that kind of summarize it. Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. And FDR said, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. So can we feel fear and still do what we need to do? That's the point of all of this, right? So exposure is all about practice. So I would encourage all of you to think about how you can be practicing your own distress tolerance and what some fears you have that you could face. So kind of just be mindful about it. And of course, in vivo exposure is the most important type of exposure, so we're gonna do it together. I want you to take a moment to mentally scan your body. If it helps you close your eyes, you keep your eyes open, I don't care. Just mentally scan your body and see if you can notice some place that's itchy. So mentally scan your body, see if you can find an itch. If you find one, do not scratch it. Just focus on that itch. Think about how it feels and don't scratch. So actually I noticed I have one on my cheek, which I didn't notice before until we started doing this, which is common. So I do this with kids often so they kind of get a sense of it. Okay, moving on to a different one. Now I want you to think about someone you love. So get in your mind the name of someone you really love. And now I want you to think to yourself, that person will die tomorrow in a car crash. <laughs> it's uncomfortable, right? And most of us don't have OCD. So you can imagine if you did have OCD and you thought, if I think this, it's just as bad as if I actually believe it, or maybe it'll actually happen, it's really uncomfortable. But we can do it. We can be uncomfortable. We can think these things in our heads on purpose as an exposure and know that it's gonna be okay. And we don't have to avoid that experience or that anxiety by saying, this is just a thought, it doesn't matter. You just kind of stick with it. Okay, so how do we convince a kid to embrace distress? 
right? Because that's not the important question. How do you get a 12-year-old to be like, yeah, I want to be uncomfortable with anything? Well, first and foremost, you have to be willing to experience distress yourself. So I always tell my patients that I'm never going to ask you to do something that I myself will not do. You don't have to be comfortable doing it, but I will do it. Of course, we have to give really good psychoeducation because anybody needs to understand why they're doing what they're doing before they do it. Okay. So if you really explain why is it important to practice distress, why is it important to eliminate avoidance and escape, once a kid understands this, they're going to be more likely to do it because they understand that it's going to be so much better in the long term. So short-term distress, long-term gain. <clears throat> We can talk about ways distress tolerance is already practiced, such as like, hey, you got up really early today for school, did you want to do that? Hey, you did your homework for math yesterday, did you want to do that? No, we experience it all the time. And we can also use parent examples, which kids really like. So for instance, like, okay, so have your parents ever been stuck in traffic? Uh, and how do they react? They're like honking, yelling at people. Well, that's not very good distress tolerance. So better distress tolerance would be like, okay, here is traffic. I'm gonna take a deep breath and turn on the radio so you can catch your parents' attitude. And then, of course, with kids, it's always good to use analogies. So the cleaning the cut wound, which I've already explained. Um, the finger trap is a really nice one. Everybody knows those little finger traps. So if you are trying to avoid the scary thought or the scary thing, you get stuck. And the only way to really get free is to approach those things instead. Um, and then the sports training one, kind of talking about the kid. Like, is, has there been a time when you were willingly physically uncomfortable for something that you cared about or liked. And really, emotional discomfort is not that much different than physical discomfort. For whatever reason, our society has taught us that physical discomfort is brave and good. I can do laps around the track, and that's great because I'm strong, but I can't have emotions, right? That's so silly. Of course we can have emotions, and of course we can face difficult emotions. And we want to practice, 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 and have acceptance about distress. I am willingly accepting discomfort because I know that this is what's going to help me in the long run. And then we also want to teach mindfulness, which as we know is effective for anybody. So mindfulness with regard to the stress tolerance is all about being aware of our thoughts, feelings, and urges. So I notice this urge, I notice this thought, I'm aware of it. And we observe our experiences with willingness and our expectations with willingness. So I am thinking that this food that I dropped on the floor is going to get me super sick and I'm willing to try it anyway. And we're gonna be non-judgmental. So that means that I'm not gonna say, this is the worst, I hate this, I can't handle this. Instead, okay, I notice that I'm uncomfortable. I notice that I wanna leave right now. I'm gonna see if I can keep going. Okay, so here are some specific ways that you can practice distress tolerance. Number one is that there is a distress tolerance scale by Simon and Gaber. Um, I don't know why the, the picture moved. Um, but basically it's four different, it measures distress tolerance on four different scales, tolerance, absorption. I think the other one is acceptance. I mean, like, but it's a good scale so you can track distress tolerance over time. It's always nice to have data points so you can see like, hey, look, you're getting better at this thing. Um, and then distress exposures. So one thing that I will do with kids is kind of a silly example to get them to start thinking about how they can practice it is I say, think about a song that you really hate. Okay, now let's listen to that song. So one song that I hate is Rebecca Black's Friday song. It drives me nuts, gets stuck in my head, it's horrible. And, I, and I'll listen to it with them. I'll say, let's listen to the song. We're gonna hate it, it's gonna be okay. We can handle the uncomfortable. And then of course, urges, right? So noticing urges to pull hair, urges to eat cookies, urges to itch, whatever it is, we can practice resisting that urge and notice what that feeling's like in our body. Um, and then, this is an important one, is screen breaks and boredom. So kids these days are so rarely bored because they have instant access to all these different kinds of things. So let's practice boredom breaks. Let's take five minutes to start out with and just sit there and do nothing and be really bored. And that's uncomfortable, but it's okay. Same thing with screen breaks, right? Like let's go a whole day, or maybe we just start out with an hour without having any kind of screens. That'll be uncomfortable. That's okay, we can handle it. We wanna violate expectations and we wanna have courage challenges. Uh, which is basically just like another fun way of saying exposure. Okay, think about someone who's really brave. Channel that person. Can you do a challenge to really show that you are brave and courageous? Sometimes using that language will get kids more involved. Like, yeah, I can do this. Okay, um, so I'm guessing that the sound in this is probably going to be similarly feedbacky. So I'll just explain what this is. 
Um, this is a video of an adult with OCD with contamination of sessions, and it's um, a portion of her session. So the person on the right is the therapist, and then the person in the middle is the patient doing her exposure. So the therapist is going to ask this woman to make a sandwich for her husband on the counter of her kitchen. And the woman gets very uncomfortable. So the purpose of me showing you this video is basically just to show her being really uncomfortable. Because it's hard to make someone uncomfortable. That makes us uncomfortable. We don't like it. And I'm sure we all got into this field because we want to help people. We don't want to make them uncomfortable. But we have to. That's a really important part of our job. Um, so the purpose of showing you this video is just kind of get you thinking, what is it, what is it like to be with someone who's uncomfortable and even make them be uncomfortable? Um, and then, what if this was a kid, right? It's even harder for most of us to make a kid feel uncomfortable. But I'll give you an example about suicidal obsessions. So I worked with a teenager who had suicidal obsessive thoughts. He wasn't depressed, he wasn't suicidal, but he had these intrusive thoughts that he was gonna kill himself. And so one of the exposures that we did is we went across the street and found one of the balconies and like leaned over. This made me really uncomfortable because I had that little thought in the back of my head, like, what if he is suicidal and I'm missing something? Or like, what if he does jump? Ah! But I had to counteract that thought with, no, this is OCD. It's okay that he's uncomfortable. It's okay that I'm uncomfortable. And this is gonna be what's best for him. So it's important that we also think about our own distress tolerance and what it's like for us to make kids and teens uncomfortable. So with regards to practicing our own distress, it's our job to make our kids uncomfortable and talk with them about uncomfortable things. We do this every day, all day. We have to talk about uncomfortable things with kids and teens. And we, and the parents that we work with, have to keep in mind what's best for kids' development as functioning, productive, and independent humans. Right? So we need kids to be uncomfortable so that they can learn and grow and be better grown-ups. So it's important to keep in mind how you tolerate your own distress, how you teach parents to tolerate their distress, and how you work with kids to tolerate their distress. So my goal for today was to try to convince you to use distress tolerance with everybody and I hope that I have done that. And that's the end. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yeah? I, I'm wondering where like self-soothing comes in. Yeah, it's a good question. Kind of depends on the kid, and it kind of depends on the disorder that you're working with, right? So for instance, with OCD, we don't really want to teach self-soothing because we want them to be uncomfortable during exposures. But when it comes to life, so for instance, if they're having intrusive thoughts during a really important math test, then I would say, you know what? That's not a good time for an exposure. Let's do some self-soothing. So it is important to teach those skills of like, maybe we do want to calm our bodies down sometimes, but it's all about when and where and how. And then of course, sometimes we need to use self-soothing just to get to a point when we can do the thing, right? And so if a kid is so anxious, even for OCD, right? <clears throat> if a kid is so anxious and uncomfortable, they can't do any of these exposures. I either have to get more creative with what kind of exposures, or I have to teach them some self-soothing skills in order just to get it down to that kind of midpoint when they can actually do stuff and use the skills. Other questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, so thank you very much for an outstanding talk. Um, I've been debating for years on whether to go on a cruise ship. <laughs> I definitely do. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering about, um, in terms of doing treatment for trauma, um, giving your sort of wound example, um, you do need to clean the wound out and debride it, but you also don't want to be overly, uh, you don't want to make it overly painful. So yes. I'm, I'm wondering, when you're doing um, this type of therapy for patients who have PTSD, how, how do you sort of like, I mean, sort of a fine line, you want to expose them to trauma, you don't want to traumatize them. Absolutely, right. yeah. So how do, you, how do you approach that? Really good question. Um, so I personally use TFCBT, which is really, really great for kids and teens. And one thing that's important with that model is they teach really good skills before you even get into the trauma narrative. So they're teaching psychoeducation, relaxation, affect regulation, cognitive restructuring, and then they do the trauma narrative. But during those skills, they're kind of weaving in subtle ways of exposure. So for instance, if I'm teaching cognitive skills and we're talking about the sexual assault, I'm going to say, okay, so when you had that sexual assault, what thought did you have? So we're not just like diving in and talking about all the details of the trauma, we're kind of weaving some, some more subtle exposure in as they're learning the skills. So that way, hopefully, when they get to the trauma narrative, they're a bit more prepared. And then with trauma, I don't quite push as much, right? It's kind of more up to the kid. I might encourage them to talk about details and I'll definitely tell them this is gonna be uncomfortable and hard, but if they wanna take a break, we take a break, 
right? Or maybe we see if we can do trauma work for five minutes and then we'll just play a game or something. And so you kind of have to be a bit more responsive to how they're doing. Thank you. I also want to thank you for a great talk. Um, what role um, do you imagine uh, virtual reality might play in, in this space? It seems like um, it may not quite deliver the same level of um, discomfort. Yeah. And yet it also seems like it might be better than taking the risk of leaning someone over a balcony. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm really excited about virtual reality. I think it's going to have a lot of promise with exposure therapy. I think I'll, I'll go back to my statement earlier when I said if it's got discomfort and uncertainty, it's still a good exposure. So if there's a virtual reality therapy where someone's like, I'm not uncomfortable about this at all, not a good exposure. But if they're like, I know this is fake and I'm still uncomfortable, still a good exposure. So I think Brian, you should uh, ask for a donor. We get a virtual reality room. <laughs> 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 I like that. <laughs> so um, I was just wondering about so I think that the cool experiment, like John said, it wouldn't just be the 10 people who didn't go on the boat, but the whole boat. Yeah. Because I'm interested in how many of the 490 actually have PTSD. Yeah. Um, so so I, I'm wondering about assessment tools or um, just what goes into your thinking in terms of, so the comment about like good parents comfort their kids sometimes I think is really good. But then there's also the some kids sometimes yeah. in some situations. Totally. And so how how are you thinking about the some kids, the certain like on the individual level, um, as you're going into this? How do you kind of? Because I know you have to assess what the parents are already doing. But as far as the individuals, kind of baseline um, tolerance. Yes. Yeah and how much you can move that, and how much individual variability you would expect to remain even. Sure. Yeah. Of course, there is a lot of individual variability, right? For so many different reasons, experience, genetics, temperament, so many different things. And so I still use SUDS. I still think it's a really useful thing to be checking in about and using. I just don't use it for knowing like when the learning has happened. Yeah. Right? And so I still, I still want things to be moderately difficult which is so different for every kid, yeah. right? And so one kid could say, well, doing my math homework is a three, and another kid could say, doing my math homework is a 10. And so we want to be finding those things that are in that middle range and kind of like focusing on those. So it is really important to think about like, what, what is hard for this kid in this situation, in this context? And then let's get creative about how we can help them do something that's moderately difficult. Yeah. No, it's. I, I think it's. I think it's. It was. It was a good talk. Thank yeah. you. I will also say that of the people I've kept in contact with semester at sea, as far as I know, none of them have PTSD. <laughs> it's a very scientific. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they. They might and just not tell me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.